Okay, here we have a high flow BiPAP and mechanical ventilation. We're going to go over a lot of these things and get to the bottom of it. Our disclaimer high flow therapy. Now, high flow is something that's um, probably not made it to um, adult uh, EMS, but it's going to get there. We're going to get a high flow therapy because there's a need for it. We're using this in, in the ERs a lot. It's kind of the intermediate between, you know, but before BiPAP because it does a lot of things. It, uh, it meets or exceeds our, our patient's inspiratory demand. It also gives us high amounts of oxygen that's heated and humidified, and we can kind of create the CPAP effect uh, that'll wash out the CO2. Now, what's our normal inspiratory demand? We walk around needing about 20 to 30 liters, okay? and that's, that's how we operate. We have about 30 liters. If we were gonna somehow gauge the speed of how we're breathing in, it's about 20 to 30 liters per minute. What does high flow do is it gives us anything above that. So if we need more than that, we could go in excess, we could go up to 60 liters and we could give our patient um, uh, help with their work of breathing that way without putting them on BiPAP. So our clinical application of high flow therapy, very simple, we have three settings. We have flow rate, which is what we're gonna dial in. And we're usually gonna start at a high, something high 60 liters and then titrate to comfort. Um, like I said, anything above 30 liters, is uh, getting therapeutic help. FiO2, we can dial in however much oxygen we want because it's a blended source. We don't have to worry about uh, coordinating the leader flow and using air entrainment. We can just dial it in like it's a vent. Okay. Uh, temperature setting, and this is usually to, uh, match, it usually matches 98.6. We match it to the body temperature just to keep the airways uh, comfortable. High flow nasal cannula, you'll see this setup. Uh, if you use it, if you use it in the field, but it's a lot. Of, it's a good alternative for patients that can't tolerate the mask, or they just need oxygenation, or they just need a little help with work of breathing. And patients find it pretty comfortable. You could, you could use. It's used a lot for children. Uh, the flows could go from 10 liters to 60 liters. FiO2 could go from room air to 100 percent. Now this graphic just shows you that how much pressure can we use to generate um, peak. Now we can create this kind of PEEP effect with high flow, which is interesting, but we can't measure it. So it's not really called PEEP, okay? uh, positive index of pressure, but it creates this kind of effect. It uses the upper airway as this reservoir, and it can kind of create this back pressure in the lungs, which kind of does the same thing as PEEP. So uh, the way that it's measured is every 10 centimeters of water generates um, one of PEEP. So if we're using 50 liters, we've got about five of PEEP. 60 liters, we've got about six of PEEP. Here's our different um, interfaces, our nasal cannula for the adults on the left, and then we have a junior one that has stickers on it. These are for our children. And then we also have one that's used for trachs. And uh, when you're measuring this, make sure that's, that the nasal prong does not include more than 50% of the nostril. The GoPap, these are great. They save a lot of intubations. Uh, and it's a very simple device. You just hook it up to the tank, and you can run it at 10 liters. And uh, it'll, it has an approximate FI2 of 30%. And if you need more, you could, you could add a nasal cannula to the inside, uh, leave it on, and do it that way. It's not precise, but it's a way to get their sat up. Um, we have three options for PEEP. We have five, we have 7.5 and 10, and you just dial it on. Very easy to use, very good. And you can actually add a neb onto this. This is very helpful. It's used for... Um, and indications from CPAP, work of breathing issues, asthma, CHF, COPD. Uh, it's not uh, BiPAP, just remember that. We're not ventilating this patient, we're just giving them some resistance to pop open uh, their airways. And you know, usually it's enough just to get, them, to get them there, get them in the hospital, and then we can put them on BiPAP. Or intubate if we have to, or nothing. Maybe that's all they need is a little bit of PEEP with some treatments and solumedrol to open them up. Okay? We're not going to use these for cardiac arrest, um, pneumothorax, barotraumas, injury of the face, all the same reasons we wouldn't use a BiPAP. Now the thing about GoPAP and any of the modalities that we're using in mass, we, we want to explain to the patient, we want to make them comfortable with it, we want to stay with them, okay? We, we want to coach them. We don't want to go, you're going to hate this. I build it up, say, look, this is going to be, this is going to be good for you. 
and they're going to feel it. They go, if they can't breathe and all of a sudden they can't breathe, they're going to want to wear this thing. Okay? Make sure it's not too tight. Okay? A proper seal is very important. But if it's too tight where it's squeezing their face and they're uncomfortable, they're not going to wear it because we want them to wear it. Okay? Um, keep using positive reinforcement. Avoid the negative statements. Um, you know, get, we need to get them to comply. There's also, you can also give them some sedation. There's a lot of sedations you could give. They're not going to depress the respiratory drive. Okay? If it's enough just to give them to wear the mask on, that could keep them from getting intubated or coding. And okay? so we got to think about it that way. A lot of the times uh, with these masks, it's just about getting them to wear it, and that's half the battle. BiPAP, non-invasive positive pressure. You will use this uh, when you've got a sicker patient who um, CPAP isn't cutting it for them, and they meet the criteria where they don't need to be intubated, but they need to be compliant. Um, the way that the, the BiPAP works, BiPAP is actually a trade name. It's uh, often called bi-level. Bi uh, BiPAP is a brand name from Respironics that they bought and kind of screws up everything, but we all call it BiPAP. Okay? Um, the settings, there's two settings. It's uh, IPAP, inspiratory pressure, and this is the pressure that we dial in when they take an inspiratory breath and they get the support. And then we have EPAP, with this expiratory pressure. It's also the same thing as PEEP and CPAP, but this is that constant pressure that we leave in their lungs. Okay, so we have the IPAP and the EPAP. We do have a rate that we set, but it's going just a backup rate. Okay, it's not a ventilator, which means if they don't breathe, we can't make them breathe more. Okay, this kind of triggers them to nudge them if they have some apnea periods. And a good rule of thumb for BiPAP is you want to use the lowest pressure as possible to uh, achieve the optimum results because their airway is not protected. If you give them too much pressure, it'll end up in their belly and it'll be counterproductive because they won't wear it. It'll also, if it doesn't get into the airways, it'll build up and create this kind of turbulent flow that won't actually reach the airways. Okay? So you're kind of defeating the purpose of using too much pressure. Waveform, it shows you what kind of breaths they're getting on my level, and they, they will vary because these are based on patient effort and it's based on what they're getting from the iPad. If they're not getting high enough volumes or it looks like they're breathing too fast, we'll turn up the iPad. Okay, so we have 352, we have 285, and then those are a little bit dinky, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn up the iPad to 15, and we get these larger tidal volumes. Okay, who should who should we not use BiPAP on? Um, they need to be able to have a spontaneous respiratory drive. If they're going apneic, uh, they need to be intubated, intubate them. Um, decrease LOC. Uh, uh, GCS, less than eight, intubate. Okay, think of it that way. Uh, inability to protect their airway. Inability to protect or to clear the secretions. Are they non-compliant? Will they just not wear it? Okay, if that's if you're not going to wear it, it's a waste of time, and we may just have to intubate them. If they had facial trauma, because uh, you need to put pressure, you need to have a tight seal in that mask. If they have a pneumothorax, this is not the best uh, modality for them. Uh, if they have um, cardiac instability, I've seen patients who are super super hypotensive, and the, we put them on BiPAP, and the positive pressure just tanks them in the code, and we end up intubating them anyways. Okay. So think about that. That's very. That's one of the things that could happen. Mechanical ventilation. Let's get into that. Um, there's a picture of all the things that go into mechanical ventilation, and this is a, a patient on in an ICU event, but it's all the same. Um, we have an ET tube. We have the OG. We have inspiratory, expiratory limbs. We've got all these things going on. Now, once you have this patient on the, you got them, you got them sedated, you got them intubated, and you're taking care of this patient on the vent, the, one of the first things you want to think of when you're when you have a patient is are they comfortable? Because as a nurse, what can you do about this? Uh, the patient must be sedated enough to dull the gag reflex, because if they don't, that's the first thing that that's, you're going to see, if they'll be gagging on this tube. Um, it's natural to have this gag reflex, so we have to dull this to tolerate the breathing tube. The breathing tube is, you ever had water go down the wrong pipe? This is a pipe down the wrong pipe. So it's not very comfortable. And if you don't get that, you don't take control of that part of it, we're going to kind of fail in every other way because they don't tolerate the ventilator. 
uh, it's just going to do them damage. Is the patient comfortable with the ventilator? Now, we're making them breathe in a way that they're not used to. Positive pressure, which is not natural. We're used to breathing negative pressure, which we pull the air from the environment. We're now using a machine to push these volumes in, so it's not very comfortable. So whatever we do with our sedation, we have to make them okay with this. Okay? We have to make them go, okay, this is how we're breathing now. Something in their brain has to click over to go, this is how we're going to take air, this is how we're going to ventilate. And if that doesn't happen, they'll fight it and they'll buck the vent and they will actually, the, the vent will actually choke them out. Okay? And I've seen patients who are under sedated and they would drop their sats in the 50s and turn blue and almost die. And then we take the vent off, bag them, kind of let them breathe on their own and they got sedated. But this pushing up these volumes in when they're not ready for it or they're fighting it, it's basically like choke, putting a pillow on their face. Okay, so think about that. Get them comfortable, get them okay with breathing, positive pressure. Sedation. So we're always assessing the need for uh, uh, relaxants, analgesics, and then paralytics if we need. Uh, because it's going to be patient machine dis dysynchrony. So we have to assess that first. You got to assess pain. Is it pain? Is it anxiety? Is it secretion, so they need to be suctioned? Are they hypoxic? Are they having, or are they having some kind of weird neural breathing pattern that's causing this dyssynchrony? So we want to correct all these problems before we, before we consider last resort paralytic, okay? Because we don't want to mask the patient's condition. We don't want to just, you know, pacify them because of all these things. Uh, now on this slide, I have consult respiratory, uh, but some in this situation. Transport nurses, you are respiratory. Okay? So you're gonna, you're gonna, if we get past pain, anxiety, all those things, we're gonna look at the machine then. Yeah, treat the patient first, then the machine. So then that's when we're gonna look at the, if we have appropriate tidal volumes, is the rate and peeps appropriate? Is the IE ratio appropriate? The flow, lung compliance, flood pressures, air resistance, appropriate mode. There's a lot of things to look over, uh, and you know, last. Resort, maybe the alarms aren't set uh, properly. So we gotta make sure that those are, if the vent is beeping inappropriately, maybe that's the key, okay? But we're gonna troubleshoot all of these things. Airway clearance and oral care. Uh, we're gonna oscillate the lungs for changes uh, as much as possible. Um, the suctioning of the ET tube to be assessed often, but let's not overdo it with the suctioning. It should only be done as needed. Uh, pre oxygenate if you can, give them 100% before you suction. But suction is not a benign procedure. I've coded patients by triggering the, that vagal response before. Okay, so only suction is needed. Also, too much suction could, could cause uh, suction trauma because you're actually putting the catheter down into the crine, it's actually touching lung tissue. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're not suctioning when we should, and that's never scheduled to prevent a ventilator station pneumonia. We're going to do oral care, and this is more of an ICU uh, modality. But just know that we're always cleaning the mouth, uh, Q4, uh, a minimum, and then we'll do it as needed. Respiratory is responsible, but we'll have uh, it's a shared responsibility, and it can be done by anyone. Head of bed is to be kept at 30 degrees uh, if you can, uh, unless otherwise indicated. And there's a lot of other indicators hypotension. If there's some procedure that they have to lay flat, or um, you know whatever reason, but make sure that if they're not, if if they don't have to be flat, we're going to keep their head up at a 30 degrees to prevent aspiration and to optimize their breathing. Suctioning technique, just to go over that again, uh, should be done um, uh, only as needed. You know, 100% oxygen, uh, and so the technique is to withdraw, is to give it. Uh, Put it down fast, wait for the cough reflex, and withdraw. Now, the thing about putting a patient on a vent is there's a lot of new things we have to take into consideration for. Um, this positive pressure will cause a drop in venous return. So we always have to assess for decreased cardiac output and give the care that we need for that. And here's a couple of pearls for ventilated patients for nursing. Uh, I want to make sure that we're um, Checking their motor skills, are they purposeful? Can they follow commands? Can they communicate? Uh, does the patient have a gag and cough? And we can check this during oral care. Um, and you know, make sure you're communicating with the patient because they can still hear you. 
even though it seems like they can't. Uh, we want to be careful about using uh, using the drugs as we don't want to suppress their respiratory drive once we get them dialed in and we get them comfortable. Uh, and then frequent repositioning because we don't want to diminish the the pulmonary effects from uh, immobility. So, so some complications with ventilated patients. Hypotension, it's going to be caused by that positive pressure because the interthoracic pressure is increased and the blood return uh, it clamps down and the blood return to the heart is inhibited. Uh, we also be, have to be aware of barotrauma. Uh, we have uh, this volume being pushed into them, especially if we're transporting. There's a lot of bumping and moving, and that could, that could easily cause pneumothorax. Bagging is very dangerous if we ever have, if we have to uh, situation where we're bagging them temporarily. Um, bagging is the, probably the easiest way to give a patient a pneumo intubated patient. Um, and there's a couple other things on this slide that really more apply to ICU nursing, but you can look at those. Preventing accidental extubations, we always want to be mindful of the reach of the patient if they come out of their uh, their sedation, and you don't want them to pull out that tube, it would be disastrous, especially in a, um, a transport uh, situation. Okay, be aware of uh, restraints and always be vigilant. Okay, mechanical ventilation is the basic ones that you'll use the most. So when putting a patient on a ventilator, the first, very first thing we want to do is, is get a tidal volume. So we'll have a place to start, and we base it on their height. Okay, a lot of uh, when we're giving drugs, we base it on weight for a respiratory, we put them on mechanical ventilation. Everything is based on height because we're ventilating uh, real estate, the size of the lungs. Uh, so if somebody is six foot and 300 pounds, they get the same tidal volume as if they're 150. Yeah, okay? Because we're just we're ventilating those six foot lungs and we're going to base this on height. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the ideal body weight and based on the height, we're going to times that by eight, six to eight mils per kilogram. Uh, and that's how we get our tidal volume. So for instance, so we have a man, take his height in inches, if he's six foot, um, 72, we'll subtract 60 and we'll times it by 2.2 plus 50 and that's how we get our ideal body weight. And then we'll times that by six or eight. So for this instance, we times it by eight and we have a tidal volume rounded down to 600. Now, this formula looks looks pretty clunky and everything. So we don't actually do this formula. We haven't done this since the board exam. Uh, so what we do is we kind of do kind of a shorthand. We get really, if you're an RT or you're around vented patients, you get kind of good at guessing heights. So we'll guess. So what I do is I'll take uh, short people get 400, medium people get 500, tall people get 600, and I'll round down. So for instance, let's say that you're 5'5", five, 5'6", five, uh, five, I'm gonna guess 450, Mills and your woman. And what we do is we also have these charts. Here's a quick reference chart, and we have these everywhere. And so, for instance, I, I chose 5.5 five, and I chose eight, 8 mils per kilogram. You can see on the chart, and we got 4.60. So I'm pretty close. And that's how we do, that's pretty much how we do a lot of our uh, title volumes, is we kind of do that shorthand. Um, but you could, there's apps that'll Hope you find it. And there's these charts everywhere, and I think uh, you'll have these available on your ventilators. And there's also formulas on how to change, make changes with an ABG. Uh, so and this is kind of the textbook way of doing it. We'll take the, so we have our vent, and they're rate 12, 500, 5, ABG is 325, 68, 92, 24. CO2 is a little bit high, and so what we want to do is we want to uh, find a rate that's going to Fix that, so we'll take the current PO2, CO2, 68, we'll times it by the current rate, and then we'll divide it by what the, the CO2 that we want. Okay? An ideal CO2 is 40, so we'll divide it by 40, and that's how we get our rest, our ventilator rate that we want to change. So we'll, cha we'll change the rate to 20, and that'll ideally give us the proper um, CO2 that we want if they're not overbreathing. So, in reality, we kind of just guess, but that's our textbook way of changing it. So there's a couple of ventilator variables. I'll let you read through these on your own. But the most important one here is the IDE ratio. And that's the one we're going to manipulate for comfort. Uh, we all walk around with about one to two, one to three, which means we're breathing in one second, breathing out three seconds. 
we can manipulate it on this vent, on the vent. So let's say we have an asthmatic who has really tight airways, they may have a longer exhalation time, uh, one to five or something. So we'll manipulate that to give them um, longer exhalation time. It also gives the, makes, it delivers the tidal volume faster. And uh, we may actually take it the other way. We'll take the ID ratio, we'll make the eye time longer to help oxygenate. So it kind of pops open the lungs, it gives them a, a longer inhale, we could pop open the alveoli. So there's a lot of things that we could do uh, to help manipulate the lungs uh, once we get them intubated. Also another thing to touch on is the limit. And when you're using a LTV, you gotta make sure that, that the pressure limit on the alarm does not sit too, uh, too low because it'll actually terminate the breath. Uh, the way that the vent is set up is if the limit is too high, it'll just stop the, stop the breath uh, to protect the patient. Okay, so the, the pressure limit is very important. If it's terminating your breaths for the vent, you don't want to do that. Assist control. So assist control is kind of the most basic mode that we use. It's kind of the go-to that we'll, and it's probably the mode that everyone's good at. So it's the, the most used mode. Uh, restore rate is set, uh, and we set tidal volume based on height, and we'll set a PEEP and FIO2. And so how this works, and so here's a pressure over time uh, waveform. And our breaths look like this, they look like shark fins. You see that? So the, the highest point of the breath, where the PIP, the peak inspiratory pressure, is at 25. And so that's when our breath terminates. And so we'll deliver this 500 mils, and at the top, the highest point of the the breath, the breath terminates and then we go to exhalation. Every breath is the same size. That's what's good about putting a patient on a ventilator is we get this consistency. So this patient could breathe 20, they, they're set at 14, but they can breathe whatever they want. They can breathe at 20 and every breath will be the same size. This section, this area right here, you notice that it doesn't go down to zero. We set at five and we're not going down to zero, the pressure, that is the peak. So we, it's a little bit of air that we leave in the lungs to help oxygenate, also to help uh, with patient comfort because we're jamming this 500 mils in and so that it doesn't slam shut, we're going to keep a little bit of PEEP in there. Now the PEEP is something that we've got to be careful with because putting in too much PEEP, we're going, to, we're going to start affecting the blood pressure because we're going to affect the venous return. So we're going to choose what's called optimal PEEP. So we'll choose enough PEEP uh, to oxygenate, but to not cause a bunch of a cardio, cardio effects. So we'll maybe check a blood pressure when we change the PEEP. We also have SIMV, and this is synchronized intermittent mechanical ventilation. This is a lot like assist control, but we have spontaneous breath added by pressure control and PEEP. Now, you should think of this as um, assist control with BiPAP. Think of it that way, because that's kind of what it does. And the reason we use this mode is it's going to help exercise the diaphragm and the respiratory muscles. Once you put them on a um, assist control and we sedate them and do all the breathing for them, they'll start to atrophy because we're doing all the work for them. This, with SIMV, we're actually, they're using the respiratory muscles to determine their own tidal volumes. So here's how this looks. So we have the same um, graph, we have pressure over time. And we have our SIMV rate of 14, we have tidal volume 500, we have pressure support of 10 over 5. And so here's what our machine breaths look like. So we have 500, that's a machine breath. And then the next breath will be a spontaneous breath based on the pressure support setting. And this one may be smaller because this patient is taking their own breaths. So it may be smaller through 10. And then the next breath will be supported by the machine, it'll be a machine breath. And based on this, we could see how they're doing. Okay, so we could, if we wanna give them more support, we could turn up that pressure support and they'll get bigger tidal volumes. It's kind of the same way if we're turning up a VIVAP. So, but it gives us a good picture of what they're doing. Okay. Either way, they're gonna get these mechanical breaths, but in between them, we kind of see what kind of effort they have. And this is good for patients who were trying to wean or patients that are doing a lot of breathing on their own anyways. They're kind of just intubated for uh, airway protection and we're gonna extubate them soon. 
Uh, there's a lot of different you know, reasons to use this mode. We're not going to use them for a lot of very sick patients, so because we want to get we want to get some kind of consistency sometimes, and we want to take their breathing out of the mix until we get them uh, healed up. But this is more for uh, patients that were they're probably going to come off the ventilator soon. Pressure control is a mode that we'll use. Um, it's very effective. And instead of dialing in a uh, volume, we'll dial in a pressure limit. So for instance, let's see how that works. So here's our uh, waveform with our pressure control patient. And you notice that we have a respiratory rate of 14. We have a pressure control set at 23. And we have a peep of five. And so what that does is it sets a pressure limit. And whatever we do inside that uh, pressure limit generates our tidal volume. So you notice we have a 478 um, tidal volume which is kind of close to what we were doing before, so we'll allow it. And what happens is the pressure is limited to protect the lungs. So the pressure doesn't go above 23 and it generates this tidal volume. Now, we have to keep an eye on this because if our patient's lungs get worse, so they get tighter, we're gonna have smaller tidal volumes. For instance, we've got a 463, and if this keeps trending down, we may have to turn up the pressure control to keep the ventilation that we want going. Uh, conversely, if we have Tidal volumes get larger, that means our patient is getting better. That means our patients are getting more compliant. And we don't need as much support. So we may turn down the pressure control at that point to keep the tidal volume the same. Pressure support is a mode that we use uh, for weaning. So we take out the rate and the volume and we're letting the patient breathe on their own on the ventilator. So think of it as BiPAP on a vent. So they have a breathing tube in and we're dialing in pressure for inspiratory support and then give them some PEEP. And so here's what this waveform looks like. Pressure support of 10, PEEP of 5. We have no set rate or volumes. We do have backup apnea ventilation though, which means if they stop breathing, the vent won't let them go apneic. It'll kind of kick in this uh, volume that we set. So here's what our waveforms look like. They're kind of all over the place because it's based on patient effort only. Spontaneous breathing, the first one is three. 352, we have a small one based on the patient effort. And so if we don't like the tidal ones, we may turn up the pressure support and give them these larger tidal volumes and give them uh, more support. 